Yeah. Ooh, wow, yes. SI Mobile. Um, feel free to add the SI 2.0 on as well. Okay, so let's see. I guess if I do this. No. <laughs> Infinity screen. Maybe this just works. Okay, I, I'm hopeful that um <laughs> I'm hopeful that everybody online is maybe seeing me just to put a friendly, I hope hopefully friendly face on things. Um, I'm Nancy Proctor. I head up mobile strategy and initiatives here at the Smithsonian. And we're absolutely delighted to have with us today uh, students and professors from the Museum Studies Program at the University of Toronto. And uh, you all have really done us a great service because you've given us an excuse to get together uh, our, our DC colleagues and hear about their recent mobile projects. Uh, at the beginning of December, we actually had our annual review of the Smithsonian projects, and all of those are online on the Smithsonian Mobile's YouTube channel. You can also find links to all of that on the Smithsonian 2.0 blog, which is smithsonian20.si.eu. Uh, and uh, so what we hadn't had a chance to hear about yet was some really great stuff happening around D.C. Um, there is one presentation missing today because of timing conflicts, which was from the National Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have just launched their mobile website, so I do encourage everybody to check that out as well, and hopefully we'll be able to get them to come in and present about it shortly, or they'll probably hold their own event as well. Um, so I uh, don't want to take up too much time with introductions, but um, I did want to uh, pass the mic quickly to Valeria Gasparotti, who is, if you don't mind standing up, Valeria. <laughs> Valeria is um, in name, my intern, in reality, my right hand and everything else, um, just has done an amazing job, including she's sort of the acting mobile marketing director for the Smithsonian and has just put, put together a fantastic plan and a lot of tips for mobile marketing that I think will be very useful um, to institutions beyond the Smithsonian, or certainly we hope so. All of that material is now online again on the Smithsonian 2.0 blog, there are links to the Smithsonian Web Strategy Wiki, um, which was, was set up and is kind of shepherded by Michael Edson, um, the Director of Web and New Media Strategy here at the Institution of the Smithsonian. So, um, I think that's about it, Valanish. I'll hand over to you to get started. Um, unless, I just did want to ask um, Costas and Adana, anything you need to add at this point? or? Okay, we're delighted you're here. We're delighted you're here. And I really, really hope the YouTube broadcast is working today. We were having some trouble yesterday. Oh, yes, that's the last thing I need to say. Um, if for some reason you're not able to speak up and ask questions through the Google Hangout, um, or if you're, you're just watching through YouTube, you can tweet us at uh, hashtag SIMobile, um, or you can email us at SIMobile. Uh, dot, sorry, simobile at si.edu. So once again, the hashtag is hash simobile, and the email address is simobile at si.edu. Okay, oh. what did you hand over to? Okay, so welcome everybody to be here today, and uh, for the presenter, I'm the one who have been stalking you during the Christmas vacation to <laughs> invite to, <laughs> you to be here, so thank you for joining us. Uh, for the topic of this event, uh, we have been inspired by the um, Taste Digital Strategy, in particular by the claim uh, digital as I dimension of everything. Uh, and we wanted to invite you to discuss uh, this claim and what could be the consequences and the impacts on mobile uh, on the museums that approach this kind of strategy. For, I'm sure that everybody is familiar with this uh, the Taste Digital Strategy, but for those who aren't, uh, it basically aims at embedding digital in a uh, every activities that the museum does. Uh, so digital is not conceived anymore as an uh, individual department as much as uh, collection and education and marketing, but it's kind of the common language uh, through which all these departments talk to their audiences. And I've been talking to people at Tate, uh, interviewing them, and still in the process of gathering their uh, ideas and opinion. But um, still, I already have some, um, some input that I would like to share with you. 
And so there are different impacts uh, on, um, from these strategies. And on one hand, there are the impacts on, on the audiences. Uh, so the digital audiences steadily grow over the year and uh, is mainly international. Uh, I think that 40% of the um, audience uh, is, uh, that um, join the site through digital platform is international. 17% of the Facebook followers are from, not from the UK, so uh, this is already something. There is far more collaboration than it was before between the, um, the audiences and uh, the different plat platform to which the museum uh, operates. And uh, a, um, a, note, uh, a little note on the consequences of mobile, uh, people of course access the museum more and more uh, with uh, their mobile devices and this uh, will cause um, the Tate to reflect more on this, uh, on how to deliver content to mobile. So every, everything they do online has to be of course mobile um, enabled. And in particular, uh, the website. They're working on different version of the website, which is not only uh, enabled to work on a mobile phone, but also meant to be used in galleries. Uh, but there are also, on the other hand, impacts uh, on the staff and on the people that work at date. And uh, these are perhaps more important than the impacts on the audiences, because it's where the change is actually happening. And also because the vast majority of people in this room are students. I'm a student as well. so. We wonder what are the skills that we will need to work in a museum, hopefully, and work in a museum and in which kind of environment uh, will be uh, the one that we will be working on. And there are, um, uh, for example, there are, the roles are changing and the function are, are, the traditional functions are merging. So there is far more collaboration among colleagues in different departments than it was before. Um, the boundaries between contents are also blurring. So, for example, the, a video that is produced by the marketing department can work and be used by the educational department and so on. Uh, another thing that is uh, being affected is, of course, authority. And this is kind of a challenge because before there was one voice, the voice of the museum, the voice maybe the director, the voice of the curator, the voice of the director of press offices, but it was still one voice. Now everybody's tweeting, everybody is doing something with digital, so it's more than one voice. So they wonder what what is what are the boundaries for this? So it's how much you can control things. Uh, where is the authority? Um, also, another challenge is that um, everybody is doing something with digital. Uh, digital is spreading like a virus. So um, how do you control this? How to prior prioritize the different projects? And is it correct to prioritize? What are the um, standards that have, and the processes that have to be put in place. And also there is uh, slow adaptation to new skills because if we think about people that working already in digital is not a problem, it's kind of the adaptation is faster, but if you think about somebody that has been working as a researcher and is an expert in his field mm -hmm. and has been, been, he has done that for all his life, it's more difficult to adapt. So for example, um, they decided to stop printing catalogs for exhibition and they do everything is digital and at first they thought okay we're gonna just put uh, a catalog of what, the contents of the printed catalogs on a website but it's not like that because then with digital you can add hypertext you can hide videos and everything so the actual research process is, is changing so the reaction inside the data have been different and there is a slow adaptation and still some skepticism but they will be fine, I think. So uh, there are some certain keywords that emerged during my conversation with the people at Tate uh, on how um, the digital will be approached in the future. And these are, for example, invisible, uh, normalized. Uh, there will be more collaboration, and we need to be proactive. And these last two are kind of my favorite, because uh, this is kind of the why we are here today. The, um, the, the field is changing, the technology proactive in it's not just one change. In the past like millions of people find the right platform platform that work for you, find find the right tools that work for you. And also collaboration. So because this is not a change that will happen in some future or some point, is that's happening now and we are in the process of 
this change. So we need to look at each other. We need to learn and share our place and face this change correctly. So uh, on this note, I would like to introduce uh, Dana Allen Gray from the National Gallery of Art, uh, which uh, that will present um, a project on teen using social media in the galleries. <laughs> Tech support here, so I opened everything and they're all down here. There's yours, and now let's see. I think I need to go here and do screen share to this. Right now. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dana Allen Greeley. I work at the National Gallery of Art, which is right there. Um, and I work on digital initiatives in the Division of Education. So I wanted to share with you a, a snapshot. I think brings up some of the issues that um, we've been discussing. It was a collaborative project. It was something that was new, that kind of challenged um, traditional museum approaches. Are um, so I think most of you have heard by now, but a few weeks ago, Selfie was declared the word of the year. Um, and this project was actually inspired. This was a selfie that was taken and posted to Instagram from a bathroom at the National Gallery of Art. And it got us thinking um, at the National Gallery. And we know a thing or two about selfies and meta selfies. <laughs> So this project is really about how can we leverage um, this kind of behavior for a deeper interaction with the museum. And our solution was to invite participation and help guide interactions with art. There we go. So for a little bit of context, each year thousands of teens visit the National Gallery of Art. Um, and the project I'm going to talk about is actually was created for a specific audience that if you think of them as sort of spring breakers, they come in big groups. They're not pre-registered, so they're not on a, a tour with us. We don't know they're coming. They just kind of come in big um, groups. They're not on a school tour. They're with a, a group often affiliated with their school, but they're kind of set loose. In fact, they're often kind of dropped off down here in the morning and picked up at the end of the National Mall at the end of the day. Um, so it's very kind of loosey-goosey. Um, so they're set loose on their own acknowledge and welcome the social behaviors of these teens that we, we see they're taking selfies of behaviors. Um, they're checking in, they're tweeting, and they're talking with their friends. So our approach was to start with something we already know how to do well, and this is the least we'll see here today. This is what my project is. It is a paper printed guide, and we've got some copies which my colleague will if you prefer a digital version, you can find it on our website um, under Visit Self-Guides. Um, so we do a lot of printed self-guides to the permanent collection, and they're sort of these, like, what to do in an hour. Here are the highlights of the National Gallery kind of thing. So that's what this project is inspired by. Um, so again, it's, it's a sort of four-page thing, um, and it highlights some of our collection. And it offers three ways to engage. Um, whereas most of our guides in the past have sort of just offered maybe two sentences about a work of art, um, this one instead asks you to snap and share, which is essentially, um, it'll give you a prompt to take a photo and share it on Instagram or Twitter. So here's an example of that. I realize it's small for those of you in the back. This one says, snap and share a photo of you or your group striking a pose as the diamond costumed Harlequin, Picasso himself or pose as a group with us. The second way to engage is to sort of create a poem or short response via Twitter. We've called this worth a thousand words. Um, and the prompt here is they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but what if you only had 140 characters? So 
where we have the very popular Vincent Van Gogh self-portrait from 1889, and we say Vincent Van Gogh struggled emotionally as an artist for 10 years before he died at 37. He wrote more than 2,000 letters to his brother Theo explaining his work. Look at the Van Goghs on this wall, because this is among several and write to Theo, brother, comma, I am, dot, dot, dot. So this is sort of a prompt to tweet or think in terms of words. And then the third type of engagement is to simply talk about it. Um, the more you look at a work of art, the more you see, talk about what you find. And here's an example. This is Watson and the Shark, um, where we ask, was this man saved, and if so, how? You know, discuss. So pretty simple concept, um, and what we're trying to do is match our offering to the needs and interests of teens, and I should back up and just say, those teens on that spring break trip are sort of the primary audience we had in mind, but we know that others will be interested in this. We've seen adults using it. There are other um, audiences engagement um, satisfying. But primarily, this is the audience we were thinking of. So we know teens are mobile and they're social. So our guide is designed um, to be easy to use with a smartphone and whatever social media apps you as a teenager want to use. Have a conversation rather than use technology. A lot of the prompts could just be used to talk with We know that teens share photos on Instagram. It's one of the most popular activities that they do on their mobile devices. 80% um, of teens uh, who use social media post photos or videos. And um, so our guide makes it clear that that activity is both welcomed and encouraged. We want you to take photos with your phone. We want you to share them online. The case in every museum. Um, and teens visiting an unguided group sometimes need encouragement and some structure. Um, and so this guide tries to provide multiple hooks for looking at and thinking about and responding to. And that's, I think, the critical part is the responding to works of art and getting engaged in a more participatory way, um, which hasn't always been the case with some of our interpretation or our guides in the past. So here are some of our intended outcomes. And I should say all of these photos are photos that were posted in response to this um, guide. It was launched last April. Um, I, I first pulled these photos in November, so these were all from that time period. So this is what we want to see. We want to see visitors are actively engaged with works of art, that they're engaged in careful looking, they're making connections between art and life, maybe they're imitating the pose of a sculpture, they're reflecting on the creative spirit, and they're having fun. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. it turns out that um, people online can't see the slides changing. Okay. PowerPoint presentation. I've actually seen this problem before. Um, so what we're just going to do is ask you to present from this view, if you don't mind. Okay. And we'll maximize the size so it'll look as good as possible. But it does mean you kind of lose your animations, I'm afraid. That's okay. This one. Um, okay, so again, we're talking about outcomes. We want teens to feel more comfortable looking at and expressing their thoughts about art. Here's an example where someone hit the caption says, big hoop earrings have always been fashionable. Let's see, how do I get to the next slide? Okay. Um, inspired to return to the gallery or any other art museum. We want to encourage the habit of visiting museums. Um, so this is a collage, it looks like, from a couple of different museums that um, this group has gone to. And then we'd really love to see teens develop a long-term relationship with the gallery. Maybe they could marry us, or they could follow us on Twitter or subscribe for a newsletter or come to a program. And we've done some evaluation, and this data is from the period of April last year to November of last year. Um, so we, when we first developed and interviews with a, a group of teens to kind of get some feedback on the content. Uh, but we've always thought that once it's kind of out there in the world for a while that we will also look at the content again and kind of tweak it based on what's engaging and what's, what's not getting people involved. Survey that's very passive, it's just on the back of this. And so we've gotten four responses, so it is not a representative sample. Guides that have gone out. 
Um, and all four responses were from people who were over 30 and they were not chaperones of teens, so they were not necessarily our primary target audience either. They gave really nice feedback, but that we need to do more. Um, so I think what we want to do in the spring is when this target audience is really here in full force, um, is of them to see how they're interacting with it, what their feedback is on whether this is the kind of thing they want to engage in and how we can make it better. Um, some things we learned with that initial focus group, are the hashtag that we're using is at NGA, um, and it was uh, hashtag NGA teens, and teens don't want to be called teens, so we learned that and changed that. So that's an example. There was some other feedback like that that was really useful. In fact, we had each prompt initially had a different hashtag so that we could kind of track what was a response to which prompt, but they felt that that was too confusing, it was too much, it was taking up too much of their precious space on Twitter, for example. So we've just gone with at NGA. Um, the downside of that is that I've noticed a lot of people using the at NGA hashtag, but I don't know if they got that idea from here or they've organically come up with it. Here's an example where there's a lot of hashtags happening here. Um, some of them, I think, in Russian. Um, so it's hard for me to know whether to include this in my evaluation of is, is someone engaged with this or do they just make up that hashtag. So again, we've handed out 19,000 in that period I talked about in the responses. We've had 171 in seven months. So you can decide what you think about that number. I would like to see it higher. Um, of those I've come to speak to Ed Mark. Ed Mark. Why, Ed Mark? Why? Okay, let's see. Uh, so I just wanted to check with the people online um, in the Hangout. Uh, could somebody just give us a shout, let us know if you're seeing slides now and being able to hear everything? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. It's your art, right? Yes, it's your art. Sorry for this monkey. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Suzanne Sarah. I'm from the National Gallery and I get to follow my fantastic colleague Dana who is phenomenal at presenting but I'll give it a go. I also wanted to thank the Pwned Supreme Nerd, because that was an awesome intro as well. Um, today I'm here to talk about Your Art. It's the mobile app that the National Gallery produced, and I'm just going to kind of give us a, a very compressed timeline of how everything um, was created. So, you cannot see my slide. Let's see if I can. I'm going to just reduce it a little bit.
All right. So we had a pro pilot project that was approved in April of 2011. And what that meant, I wanted to show you on the screen what, what the initial home screen looked like uh, on the top left, and then in the center is what it looks like now. One of many screens that it has, it actually has a rotating um, selection of about 35 different artworks that we have at the gallery, which is very compelling. Uh, the pilot project was approved by our governance committee in 2011. And our governance committee was a committee that we had to submit all technology projects to that would review kind of the, the merit of projects and then approve it based on the goals that, we've, that we had set out. And the, the goals were pretty minimal. And um, we accomplished basically all of them and more, which is very exciting. Um, what it was was to gain valuable insight regarding on-site mobile delivery at the gallery um, using existing content that we had from our Acoustic Guide tours. And I'm sure everyone here knows what Acoustic Guide is, I'm sure, right? Awesome. OK. Because I'm going to mention that a couple of times, and I want to make sure that there's context for that. And it was also to encourage visitor experience and deeper looking at the objects that we have in our gallery. And that is quite important to our education department, based on a lot of what Dana has already said. So I wanted to show you this, because this is, I thought, to me, uh, a very compelling image because we use something called MS Project, which I'm sure a lot of you use, that create these lovely Gantt charts. And what we set up here was we realized what our requirements are, both hardware, software, and human capital, enabled to it enabled us to understand our deliverables and um, our dependencies for this project, which were quite a volume. And you'll see why in the next slide. So these are just a few of the NGA folks that participated in this project. And one of my colleagues is actually sitting in the audience right now is John Gordy. He worked on this project and was um, actually principal in selecting the uh, contractor that we work for and the in initial architecture for this, for this platform. So um, and great, it's great that he's here. I want to just show you that the volume of people that are here are from our IT department, like four folks. And we had a um, ton of interns who are just phenomenal that um, work with us and still do to make this this run. And we had folks that actually create the housing for our eye touches, which are in the West Building Rotunda. They created a custom um, cabinet for us that charged the, the, the devices um, and allow the Acoustic Guide folks to dis distribute them and update them in a timely fashion. It's pretty awesome. So what I want to show you here is on the kind of the left to the right, you can see the, what it was and what it is now. And these changes we'll talk about a little bit in the future. But you can see how we took into consideration what we learned through the uh, series of evaluations that we did. And again, thanks to the education department, we have a great team of people that do this work. So we launched, you can tell from April 2011, we launched the pilot project on February 14th, 2012, which was actually um, an important date for us because that was the 14th anniversary of the new website. So we kind of timed it that way. We, um, we uh, are very romantic at the National Gallery. <laughs> so on that day, we launched it with 131 uh, collection highlight objects and 50 objects that are from the children's tour. So of the uh, 131 objects in the tour, and I don't know who, if you want to right now, it would be super awesome if you download the app. It would be great for our stats too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and play around with it a lot. Um, we have several types of image size in there, thumbnails, and then the regular size thumb, um, image, and then we also have a zoomable image. We have uh, audio that accompanies each of the objects. Uh, that's by the appropriate curator for that type of object. And we have, um, it's located in, not geolocated, but located on a map of the gallery. And we also have um, a text that is associated with the object, some of it from online and some of it from other uh, locations. So that went really well, the three-month pilot project. And we had an, a, an evaluation project that came out of that. It was a very small one. Like Dana said, we handed out surveys at the desk where the iTouches were distributed. Um, 537 iTouches were issued, which is kind of phenomenal because we don't really do much advertising for our stuff, especially when it's kind of a beta. And we don't want anybody to see that it might be going wrong. So it, folks went there, and they picked up the iTouches. And then uh, a number of them, 134 surveys were returned. We got very top level kind of responses. Um, folks were excited. We, we saw a lot of responses saying folks were excited to actually download the app when it was in the store, and they were waiting for that. Um, we saw that the majority were within the range of our typical um, 
visitor, which you can see is over 50, which is pretty awesome because you think that they're coming in and taking these eye touches over the Acoustic Eye. And um, what helped a lot with that was that the folks at the Acoustic Eye desk, some of them were extremely familiar with the technology, and some of them actually were within the range of 60, 70, 80 years old, and were teaching some of their peers, so they felt there was that comfort level, which was kind of phenomenal. Um, so from there, we were allowed to continue our pilot project. So through the summer of 2012, we started another evaluation project. Um, it was the approach that we took was kind of a sociological uh, approach to this um, to this uh, evaluation um, based on the expertise that we had in our education department. So what we did, and I always mess up saying this word out loud, thematizing, um, designing, and interviewing, and then transcribing. So what we did thematizing is that we created these different kind of um, chat methods and way we wanted people to evaluate the project. So we said, this is the route, the path you're going to take, and we're going to watch you do it. So look at an object, listen to the audio, go to this room, that kind of thing. Use the map first, that type of thing. Then the um, the designing aspect was part of the thematizing, where we would design the tour specifically around the theme that we wanted to evaluate. At the end, we interviewed each of the candidates, and then we transcribed immediately to ensure that we got the data correct. Oops. So what we did uh, initially to our community, and we got back um, a substantial number of responses. From that, 29 folks were chosen. I don't know if anybody here, some people might be here, um, or listening online that were chosen. We initially sent out a questionnaire to give a, get a little background on these folks, um, what their comfort their comfort level with smartphones, their age, their lo location in um, their education level, um, things like that. And then the second was we met them um, on site, gave them limited information, and then followed them around, kind of like a, if in a way, kind of. Margaret Meadish, we gave them the iPhone and then kind of scurried behind them and then recorded while they were um, while they were moving around uh, recording that are more <laughs> that aid in comfort for the folks that you're that you're observing um, like things like if you're going to sit there with your your placard and, and record I don't know if folks ever did anthropology classes but if you allow the person to kind of see what you're doing they're a little bit less uncomfortable it's like going to the doctors and telling them you have a problem and he writes furiously if you kind of let them look at what you're doing they don't feel so uncomfortable with your work and then afterwards we did an interview saying just basically to listen to what they were saying um, what they thought of it frankly what how they thought we could improve it and where they saw it going and how they would like to use it and that was extremely helpful, and all the folks were critical but um, and helpful, but also kind, which is awesome interviewers. They're all going to come for a party later. So out of these 73 people that submitted their names, we chose 29, as I said, and of these 29, 76, um, sorry, 76 percent were between 18 and 40 years old, and 24 percent were between, are over 41 years old. Um, 72 percent, as you can see, um, were identified as working in the technology field, and this could be, and definitely is, probably in the means in which they got the information to submit their name to be to participate in the process. And 41% identified as working in an arts-related field because those are the folks that would be following the information leads that we'd be putting out there. Um, overall, the folks that participated were well versed in the smartphone, and I would kind of hope they would be by that time because most people have them. Um, I'll just, an aside, our deputy CIO still has something I call a cricket. Mm -hmm. So, and about one third of the respondents reported uh, using art museum apps already. We recorded which ones those were and why they were significant and how often they used them. So, on an average scale of um, an overall rating, we got a 7.7, which wasn't bad. Um, room for improvement, which is where we were going, what we wanted. And ease of use was 7.3. And again, what we expected and kind of what we wanted, we got information out of that. Um, the things that I were, we, we were interested in, and this is high level again, were they likely to download? 20, not 25 of 29 said yes. And were they likely to use it on site? 25 out of 20, 29 again said yes. So what I wanted to show you here was some of the results of the second evaluation that we did. Um, you can see 
uh, where I had the arrow where it says enter. So that arrow there was really confusing for folks. Um, that nav button, they had no idea that once you put in your key code, that, that you hit that to enter the key code. So instead, we put the word go, solve the problem, people know what to do. Um, you'll also see um, in the smaller screenshot in the bottom here that you see the little house. And that's like something you see for home button, basically drawn from Firefox. Folks wanted something, rather than going back with the arrow key, they wanted something to go back to the initial home screen automatically and quickly. That solved a lot of our problems too. Um, again, on the, on the left side of the screen, or right side of the screen, I can't do, I'm not stage left or side, right? You see here it says picture frame and dot. Initially we had a picture frame for the object on the map, and then a blue dot for the location. This caused kind of pro a lot of problems, because the picture frame and the dot look a lot alike. People couldn't tell that it was a picture frame, or actually what it did. So the picture frame brought you the object and location, and uh, that was it. And the dot actually just showed you the room. What we did, and the dot actually resembled a lot like, a, like the Google dot, so people thought it was going to be geolocating them to the space that they were going, which it didn't, and it was disappointed. So what we did was we changed the icons a bit and removed one of the icons entirely. So you can see on the, the, on the side and below it, we changed them to be a little bit more of a location dot rather than something that looks like it's going to start animating or kind of, um, as the Google does, kind of throbs in the space. That solved a lot of our problems, and um, it, was, it, it turned out to be pretty successful. So these are kind of the key seminal points <clears throat> of last year. In February of 2013, we launched our app to the iTunes store. Um, we wanted it for the 14th again because we're so romantic, but um, things prevented that. So we launched it on the 28th. Wi-Fi in the building, which was very helpful. So in the place where you can get iTunes, um, I'm sorry, where you can get the iTouches in that kind of area, you can also, in the rotunda, in the founders room, and in the um, art information room, you can now download the app in situ, which is kind of awesome. The other thing that just happened recently is that you can now get Wi-Fi in our cafeteria, so I would recommend to go eat a lot and use the <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> It's the new Starbucks. <laughs> so I, one thing I wanted to mention to the, because I, I know like uh, a couple uh, gov gov people are watching this. We submitted our app to MobileGov, which is a site that how dot gov mobile apps, and they are very. Um, they do not have a lot of museum or art apps there, so they gave us a lot of press. They sent out a newsletter to their distribution list, which is tens of thousands of folks. Um, once when we actually submitted it to Google Play, which is super awesome. Um, just in November, which is kind of awesome, on, on Thanksgiving Day, and the reason why we did it on Thanksgiving Day, not because I am thankful for it, is because it was a Thursday, and Thursday is the ideal day to, to post your um, objects to iTunes. You get a lot of traction that way. Uh, and we also uh, liaison over there who was very good about ensuring that it got posted in the different locations. So the awesome thing about posting it that day is that it went to play, the new binary went to the iOS, and um, we also released our Russian, French, Japanese, Chinese, uh, and Spanish, I, I repeat one of those, um, uh, and um, tours, which was so cool because we, we localized our app and then submitted it in three different manners. Localizing it meant that the folks in those different locations whose devices already are set to that language would be getting our app in that language. The other thing that we did, um, well, I'm going to get to that. The other thing that we did is that we added a button to the home screen that says you can change your language. So if you're a student, like a lot of times when I was studying abroad, I wanted to learn that language better. I would take the device in that other language to learn the language better. So here, folks can can if they want to if they're bilingual can also um, take the de take the device and change it to Russian or Japanese, whatever language they wish to learn. What I wanted to show you briefly was a little bit of the back end. So we have a CMS here, um, that ma major part of the screen here. It houses all our audio files. Um, houses all our we have some we have weekly maintenance, which I try to keep to a minimum because nobody likes to update their app all the time. But we use a CMS that houses our XML JSON. TMS act extracts that we use to update the location of the objects weekly. We have HTML and CSS. So the CSS actually um, works with both the HTML and works with the JSON files in order to style the text 
uh, that you um, on the bottom of the screen is this crazy amount of text. That's one of our XML files that we use to update exhibitions and coordinates. It's all in JSON as well. It's a language that works well with uh, Python, which you can use through the terminal to update both the audio and um, the audio and images in bulk if you're comfortable that way. It's super fun to learn how to use that. I want to say that we worked with our um, contractor that we worked with on this, and they're called Tristan, and they're phenomenally lovely people. Um, I'm going to shout out for Simon Dale. So what I want to show you here is the stats that we've been recording since we uh, launched the app in February of the, uh, 2013. You can see we use something called app figures, and app figures is something that, that counts the number of times our app was downloaded. So it's something on the outside. So you can see here that my arrow is missing. I think it's because it's animated. But from November to December, um, the app was downloaded an enormous amount of times in China. They really, really loved our app. Um, I have to say it was only the majority of it was the iOS. And, and thinking about it afterwards, I was a little disappointed that Android was, didn't, um, there wasn't an uptake of Android. But then there's the Google issue with um, China right now. So it's politics. So hopefully in the future, if that is resolved, our Android app in China will explode like our iOS did. Um, so currently, uh, based on the numbers on the 12th of January, you can see we had 22,293 downloads of our app so far, which is pretty phenomenal. We have an upward trend. Here we use something that's in-app um, statistics called Flurry. Um, we just recently started using it. It's um, in a way kind of like Google Analytics, it tracks events. Um, and you can see here that basically we have an average amount of events. So it's kind of like page views versus unique visits. So it's you can see that we have like weekly, we have about 1,300 people accessing our app. And of those 1,300 people, there are 4,500 um, times that, that it is being accessed. So the number of people accessing the app is multiple multiple occasions per week, which is a great thing to see. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me there or um, ask Nancy because she's the expert on mobile. <laughs> if I know anything about mobile, it's because I've been able to learn from colleagues like you all. And um, I'll also say from our wonderful um, vendor colleagues who um, have really taught me a lot. And of course, I got my start at working with a mobile vendor antenna. OK, so let me get this open. And um, thanks, everybody online. You've been doing a wonderful job of um, being quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for mu muting yourselves so I didn't have to mute you here. That then means, of course, if anybody does have a question when we get to the discussion bit, um, you can just unmute yourself and pipe in. And uh, we do want to hear from you. Okay. Without further ado, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Herman, and I'm the digital media manager at the Phillips Collection. And if you're not familiar with us, we're actually a, a small nonprofit art museum, uh, modern art museum in DuPont Circle. Um, and so I'm going to talk um, about two projects, really. I'm going to go through sort of the process of our um, recent redesign, which uh, was launched in, in uh, September 2012. Um, and some of the mobile aspects that we enhanced during that process, as well as some of our um, uh, Twitter activities, because it's a very mobile platform. I think it's about 75% mobile users. So, uh, without further ado, um, basically, I started at uh, the Phillips in 2011, September 2011. So. I was charged with leading the website redesign, and so I'm going to show you what it looked like before. Um, uh, so there was a couple of problems with our site before. One of the biggest ones was that we were actually getting uh, increased mobile traffic. Um, this shows, uh, I think it starts September 2010 to August uh, 2012. So we were just every, you know, every month getting more and more and more. So, but our site was not mobile friendly at all. 
Um, it had flash on the main page and um, uh, a lot of invalid HTML and some strange CSS stuff going on. So um, this is what it looks like now. Uh, we um, it's built in HTML5, and um, so it's completely mobile friendly. It uh, looks beautiful on tablets, on desktop, and also on phones too. Um, this is a view on an iPad, um, and so uh, we wanted to make a responsive site at the time, um, but with the CMS that we were in, uh, there were some challenges doing that, so instead we created a mobile site, so m.phillipscollection.org. And when we were thinking about this, we were really um, thinking about uh, what a visitor who is on their way to the museum needs to know, because we are closed on Mondays, and I know when I go to New York and go to museums, I always end up going to the museum that's closed on that day. So um, we were thinking about, you know, what do they need to know? Are we open? How to get there? What they're going to see? And what they can do. So the content is um, actually being populated from the main site CMS, because as a uh, small institution um, with limited staff resources, you know, trying to kill two birds with one stone is kind of the way we need to go a lot of times. So we didn't want to double um, entry uh, the data into the mobile site. So it's reading from the main. And so people seem to like it. Um, this is a tweet from Kristen Caps, who's the um, uh, editor of Architect Magazine. And um, people are using it, so we're happy about uh, that. Um, also, part of the redesign was um, before the redesign, we uh, didn't have a real system for our multimedia. Um, we produce a lot of videos. We produce an exhibition video for every exhibition. We have several um, audio series, conversations with artists, and different lectures and talks, but we had no place to put it on the site. So we were actually using um, YouTube and Vimeo as our sort of content delivery network. And that posed a challenge because um, in YouTube videos into our website, you know, it didn't look that great. There wasn't really a way to style those uh, players. And also we couldn't take those videos and publish it to multiple platforms. We couldn't use the same video on the app, on iTunes, and other places. So with the redesign we created, um, we now host our multimedia on a cloud-based um, content delivery network. Um, we are currently moving into uh, the Drupal content management system, so we might look at actually putting it into the system. Um, but at the time, this is what we had to do um, so this is the multimedia section. Um, we uh, adopted the JW player uh, as our multimedia player. Uh, and the reason for that was uh, it, it has the ability to read XML files and create playlists. So we were able to put all of our conversation with the artists series as one XML file. And what's great about that is that same XML file is also published to iTunes U and also to our app. So we get you know, more bang for our buck with that one file. Um, here is what our iTunes U site looks like. We uh, launched this in November 2012, so shortly after the redesign. <clears throat> and so now I'm going to talk about some of our Twitter stuff. So like I um, mentioned before, I, I, I thought it was important to talk about Twitter because um, sometimes it's not in the mobile conversation, but it's such uh, a mobile platform. So, like I said, 75% of users uh, uh, are mobile users, which is what Twitter reported, I think, in June 2013. So we have, we have over um, 15,000 followers, which is actually... Um, more than our likes on Facebook. And um, so some of our activities during the, we actually had a relaunch party for the website. And uh, we held a Twitter scavenger hunt where visitors on site and off site um, 
followed uh, the hashtag relaunch hunt and um, answered questions that they could find the answers to on our website. So we were sending them from Twitter to our new website to kind of promote it to show, you know, the new collection section, um, how all of our exhibition videos. So um, we gave out, I think we, we um, asked questions every 15 minutes or so and gave out about 15 prizes. Um, and so another one of our recent Twitter um, initiatives is a series called Break for Art, um, which is a Twitter chat series. And this is actually a collaboration between the communications department and the education department. And so, <clears throat> like I mentioned, um, Mondays we are closed. So we wanted to find a way to open up the museum virtually to our visitors. So uh, between 12 and 1 p.m. every Monday, we discuss one work from our permanent collection and invite uh, participants to ask questions and kind of uh, participate in the conversation. And so this, again, we were happy with the response. Got a little uh, tweet from Tyler Green, uh, who writes for Modern Painters and Modern Art, art Notes. Um, and uh, so that was, we were happy about that. Another one of our um, Twitter uh, series, every uh, Conversations with Artists, um, uh, session we live tweet and um, it's great because we actually get a lot of interactions during those and, and even um, parallel live tweeters. Um, there's uh, Brian Feldman who frequently uh, uh, parallel tweets with us so we're um, happy about that and um, uh, let's see so closing thoughts I just wanted to kind of like reflect on some of the questions that we were sort of asked to think about today. How do we create mobile projects that function in synergy with other systems? And how do we create these strategies um, modeled on digital as a dimension of everything? And so I, from my personal experience um, working with some of these projects at the Phillips, think it's all about collaboration and coordinated content creation. And when I say collaboration, yes, I mean between departments, um, you know, the uh, Break for Art series was a great collaboration between the education department and uh, the communications department. But I also mean um, <clears throat> collaboration between the systems that these projects are built in. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot more um, museums developing their own APIs. Um, so like the Cooper Hewitt that has developed their collection API. Um, because the systems should really be able to talk to, e to each other and kind of cross-pollinate um, the content. Um, also, the uh, content creation, I think one of the issues that we tend to have is we should go into it thinking um, about the content first, not the uh, end product. I think a lot of times, um, you know, a curator might ask, I want to create a uh, ebook, you know, and it's like, okay, that's great, but let's think about, you know, what are the assets we have, um, what do we want to accomplish, and um, what are all the different places that we can put this content on instead of just the one thing. So um, I think that's all I have, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so okay, I'm just going to switch over here. I'm going to switch into slideshow because I do have a couple animations that I'm going to show. Okay. Couple slides. You know how to. Um, let's see. First, let's, this is this one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me just show you how to do this. Come back to this screen. That's the slideshow. And you just want to choose the thing that you want to invite you to see. And then, if so, um, it's this green one. I'll just give you a shout out. You can just, okay, so if you both into the thing that you want to share, mm -hmm. then you just select it, search for and share. And again, I'm sorry that we aren't able to the animations. Okay. All right, cool. Please introduce All right, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Chris Magnuson, and I am the Instructional Specialist at Live and Learn It. And uh, today I'm going to talk about why we need to pack emotional baggage. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, quick background. Live and Learn It is an educational nonprofit here in Washington, D.C. We work with fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. Um, but I want to talk about emotional baggage in a positive way. Um, and that is we want to get students emotionally involved, emotionally invested in their trips that they take with us. Just a quick background. Uh, down, right? Okay, good. All right, so Live It, Learn It creates engaging field trips for students in some of our highest um, um, poverty, the highest need elementary schools here throughout D.C. And we create these um, programs, but it's not just about a field trip. We also do a pre-lesson in which we go to the classroom. We, t we teach a lesson to the students in order to prepare them to go on the trip. And we also do an engaging, reflective post-lesson also. So with every class, we have three touches with them. And our model is where we have a pre-lesson, a trip, and a post-lesson. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that students are not only really engaged in the program that we're, we're you know, leading them on, we, um, we also want to make sure that they're learning as much as they can before and after the trip also. Um, uh, Live and Learn has been around for nine years. We've worked with over 10,000 students here in D.C. And one of the great things is we're trying to connect students that don't connect to these great institutions that we're sitting in right now all throughout the city. We want to, we want to build that bridge. And one of the questions that we have as an organization, too, is you know how do we maximize educational impact of a museum visit in a limited time frame? And as I was saying earlier, when we do those pre-lessons with students, we only have 75 minutes, and so that means we got to come in, we got to teach a lesson, we got to prepare them for this trip, um, but it's a limited time frame. And because of that, we have so much content that we want to fit into that that it's tough in order to kind of scale back and make sure that the students become student-centered for the for for that activity too. And so one of the things that we were in, in, uh, hypothesizing is how can we use digital tools, technology, in order to kind of maximize our impact with our students. And one of those, I'm going to share with you two ways that we do that. One is through a, a pre-lesson jumpstart, and the second is through our mobile app. Um, the first um, idea we had is, well, let's kind of build out. How can we build content knowledge with students before they um, see us for the first time so that we can kind of front load a lot of the content and then have a really hands-on engaging experience with the students when we're in the classroom with them. Well, our first iteration of that was, as you see here, we have a program with the um, Natural History Museum that deals with rocks and mineral minerals. And um, our first iteration of this was basically a PowerPoint slideshow. And we thought, hey, we'll put this in the hands of the teachers. They'll show that to their students. The students will be able to learn a lot. And then I'll come in for the pre-lesson, and boom, we'll get right into the activity. Well, what I found is when I go into the classroom, I had to do all of the review because, surprise, surprise, a PowerPoint slideshow that basically was a lecture to the students was not that interesting to them. Um, and as we learned from you know, the success of MOOCs, um, there's some issues with that. So. One of the things we thought is, okay, well, what is it with tech? What is it with you know technological tools that can engage students, can build content knowledge, and also can prepare them? And one of the models we thought about was video games. Video games work well. We're a small nonprofit. We basically have um, there's eight people in the office, and there's also no um, IT people, or also no working budget for technology. But we were able to create a video game like. Um, uh, video game-like experience using PowerPoint. And um, I just want to share with you, this is, this is the, the pivot from that. So instead of saying, you know, we're going to be looking at everyday um, rocks and minerals, here we've created this own video game piece. Are you building that? Okay, cool. All right, so one of the things is, what, what do video games have? They have a character. So we start off with Zernop. He's our, he's our character here. It shows some love. And the students can start the adventure here. And as it says in here, we want to make sure that the students have a mission, an idea of what is actually going on, how they're actually helping this character out. Um, as you can see here, he left his planet Philia, and he's on a mission to say, I love you to someone special. Okay? And now in your mind, you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with rocks and minerals? But we're getting there. Okay? Well, one of the things is that Zernoff is actually looking to um, his earthly treasures to find something that says, I love you. And now what we've set up here is what, what, why video games are so powerful is that it, student choice is built in. And then it becomes a choose-your-own-adventure kind of activity in which students are able to kind of solve the problems on their own. And as you can see, these three choices, um, surprise, surprise, um, whatever they choose, they'll end up going into exploring rocks and minerals, okay? You know, chocolates and flowers are not going to make it back to their planet, right? Um, but in order to this, this builds that narrative piece that really gets students engaged in thinking about how can I solve this problem. And I want to... 
and Nancy, you were telling me I do I don't do this. So I want to show you the slide with the animations real quick. So are they in this folder? Uh, well, so this is the next slide. Oh, it is the next yeah, slide. Yeah, I just do slides over here like that. Well, um, yes, and only the people in the room will be able to see it. Okay. So my apologies to anybody who's out um, watching this on Google. Um, I'll just show a couple of slides here too. But um, just real quickly, again, without a budget, so once the students have come in and they've kind of made their choices, they end up into a mine. Well, what does a mine look like in this atmosphere? And then, oh, maybe i got to do this. Sorry. Again, we don't have a budget, but we're thinking about how do we create this experience for students in order to do this. And this is simply done just on PowerPoint. You add a little sound effects, a little graphics, and stuff like that, and you kind of go. And the students, now the students are like, hey, I want to go in there. Right? <laughs> Seriously, they do. Okay. And so they click on their thing. And now they're in a decision process. Okay. So now they got a mind. And I guess my audio is not coming through. Anyway, so they're, they're in the mind. They've got to figure out where is it that they're going to go. And they choose a rock that they can see there. Then um, I've truncated this for this presentation, but there's a lot of characters that you can see through here and decision points for students and so on and so forth. But we're building in that content. We're building in experience and all those things that good video games do. And the piece that I want to bring to your attention here is, um, you know, we don't need 3D animation, just a picture and a thought bubble, and students believe it. They're like, okay, they're engaged in this as long as they're um, they're, they bought into this mission here. They're building that emotional baggage in order to do that. Let's see what that looks like. This is a short video. Okay, so just real quick, I'm just going to get out of that. It may have been hard to, to totally hear what they were saying. What will happen? I mean, did I mess up? Sorry. It's okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so one thing I just want to share with you is, you may not have been able to hear the students there, but you notice in that situation, you didn't really see a teacher in front of the class. You, didn't, you saw students talking to each other, they're reacting to it. And the other thing, too, is they're, they're having those conversations. Um, the last conversation we had with the students around the computer, they're saying, hey, it's your turn. Now you're going to read. And they're reading together, and they're building that teamwork there and trying to go through this, too. Well, that opened up a lot of space for us in order to actually um, have our pre very hands-on, very student-centered, very student-directed. And again, all of this is designed in, because we're going over to the Natural History Museum, and we're trying to prepare students to learn about rocks and minerals in an engaging way. And that's why I started off talking about we want to build that emotional baggage because we want them to be emotionally invested. And now, when we be able to have that student generate a student activity um, with um, our pre-lesson, um, that it was a totally different experience. Now I can get right into um, the hands-on activity that we had. They had built all this knowledge. They were excited. They wanted to help Zernoff off and figure out how to do all this stuff. And all of this was really easily done. As I said before, using PowerPoint, and we also use this thing called iSpring Presenter. iSpring Presenter is a, is a program that allows you to export your PowerPoint um, in the HTML5 file, um, which is really powerful because it opens up some different tools. And imagine that this is something that could be a downloadable thing from the web. This is something that teachers could upload onto their, their um, tablet devices. And then this is an engaging process. Again, all of this with the idea of getting students prepared for their museum visits. So sorry. No, it's quite all right. Um, I think uh, the technology just fell over. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to try to do is get it back. Are you able, do you want to just show to this room what's in here? Mm -hmm. And um, sure. when you are not needing to touch the computer, I'll keep working on it to try to get <laughs> hang out back. OK. Um, what's that on my own? You can actually. Yeah. OK. So. Um, as I was saying before, um, so narrative is key. It's an iSpring presenter was what we used in order to do that. Um, but what we have is, is um, in doing that, that, that's one piece. That's kind of preparing the students in order to do this. And that's our digital tool for thinking about how do we get students engaged in this. But the other thing, too, is 
how do we also maximize our time with our students using technology in the field? And one of the things we want to think about our mobile device as far as thinking about how do we bridge um, that field trip back to the classroom. We want to build a really exciting experience for students in the museum, at the site, and we want to make sure it's interactive and student-driven while it's there. But as an organization, we also want to make sure that we are, are creating this narrative across, you know, from that pre-lesson all the way to the very end when we're back in the classroom that third time so that it's all very cohesive. And one of the things um, that we've been able to do is we've been able to build an app using Open Data Kit. And um, again, we don't have a tech budget, we don't have any IT people, but I'm sharing this with you, and especially for um, all the grad students in the, in the audience too, that these are things that you can build right now. You don't need anything to do this. Open Data Kit was originally designed for healthcare workers in, in um, third world countries, and we thought that's a perfect fit for us. Um, that's a joke, no. But what, the reason why I'm, I'm saying that is because that's the cool thing about technology is because you can look at it in one realm and say, wait a minute, I could use that. And we repurposed it in what we were doing here, too. Um, so um, basically, how does it look? Well, it's basically a survey. That's basically all it is. It sets up questions, and we're able to embed photos into it. You're creating a drag-and-drop XML file that is posted using Open Data Kit Collect. And the cool thing is, is all of the data that students create out in the field, whether it be answering um, multiple choice questions, whether it be texting actual answers, or even taking photographs, all of that gets uploaded into an Excel spreadsheet um, that's on uh, Open Data Kit's server. Um, the cool thing about this also, which is, you know, we're excited about, which is, you know, where, where <coughs> excuse me, mobile, <coughs> where mobile technology takes us, is now the trip also is student driven. So they're making decisions. They're, they're exploring the different places. This is an example from our trip to Mount Vernon, um, where we're specific about um, slavery. And um, so they're answering questions that we've created, and they're also we're also creating a situation where there's choice. And here's an example where we want students to take a photo of something in the women's quarters that surprised you, because we want to know what students are thinking. We want to have that conversation with students too. And the cool thing about Open Data Kit is it's already created, so it's integrated into the Android uh, phone, so they can take the photos and be able to do that. And then what do we do afterward? Well, real quickly, we take that we take that Excel spreadsheet. We, turn, we use Microsoft Publisher, and we basically make a mail merge. So we take all of the data that the students have done, and we create a document that we can take into the classroom with them afterward. And so here's an example of a paper, a piece of paper, that we would give to the students. So you can see up at the top, this is Brianna's trip to slavery at Mount Vernon. Um, Brianna's name's there because obviously it's one of the first questions in the survey. Boom, her name's up there. And then these are photos that she took, and at the bottom is a space for her to reflect on that. So here, we can take those devices back to the office, we can upload all of the data that the students have, and we can print out these individualized papers for every student, go back into the classroom, and now the students can reflect and create reports based on what they've learned at the site, and it, it kind of integrates everything together. So it enables us to have this, this experience where students see themselves making decisions and see themselves even all the way to the post-lesson, that kind of makes the entire experience very cohesive. So what are our takeaways? Well, one is we, it's really important to build that emotional buy-in. So how do you get how do you get students to even care about your program? How do you get students to care to come and come on your program? Um, we also say you know create a cohesive narrative for the entire experience for students. So as you saw that thing I started off with with the um, um, you know Zernoff the alien um, that narrative goes all the way to the very end of our post lesson in which we sit down with students and they present their solutions to that problem of what they think Zernoff should take back to his planet. And, and life, lastly is that we can do this in the sense that we don't have a budget or even a staff, but we've been able to put these tools together and to make it happen in a very short period of time. And, we've, um, we, and we're, we're aiming for June in order to build a whole cohesive program for the Martin Luther King Memorial and do some um, um, training for teachers in order to, uh, to roll that out next year also. Um, and so our next steps is um, we're getting, um, we're looking for a class set of androids. We have a, a small um, group of, of androids that we're working with. We've done this all field testing with a small um, group of students, but we need to field test with a whole class, um, and we just basically need Android bricks. No connection or anything like that, so I'm just putting a plug. If any of you have an Android that's collecting dust, let me know. Um, and then once we know what we're doing, then we can start getting a developer on board and customizing it and making it, making it a real app. 
So I just wanted to thank everyone here for this opportunity to share what we're doing. It's exciting. And, um, and also um, hope this gives inspiration. If you have an idea you want to do, you can do it because um, we did it and we don't even have a staff or IT. Thanks. <laughs> No, it's not your fault. So uh, my apologies to everybody. We've got a room full of technologists here, so of course it was all going to fall over. Um, I think our problem is the network. Is it, has anybody else been trying to do something high bandwidth? Yeah, I think the network's fallen over. I think what I'd like to do um, is just to buy some time for myself. Um, to try to get us back into the hangout is ask Valeria, do you mind going ahead and speaking? Can you do it without your slides? Okay. Um, and then I'll just, just ignore the person behind the screen here <laughs> trying to get us back into, um, into the hangout for those who've fallen off. Okay. So um, during my internship here with Nancy, I've been mainly working on the development of a marketing plan for the Smithsonian mobile offering. And um, kind of the context in which I was uh, working on is that the Smithsonian has over 40 between mobile apps and mobile websites. Uh, and these are all, yes, can you hear me? Okay. Um, these are all different projects uh, starting from different institutions and responding to different needs and with different aims. So uh, it's kind of confusing. Uh, in 2012, over 1 million people were reached through uh, mobile. Uh, the most, uh, among the most downloaded apps, there is the Smithsonian mobile app, the, like, kind of the um, comprehensive app that uh, organizes um, all the events and the collections and um, the, the location of the different museum on the mall, uh, Mihandurta and the Zoo app. I'm not going to tell what they are about, so you have to download them all. <laughs> and let's say that the preconditions that for this marketing plan was that were that um, visitors today kind of expect to find some kind of uh, mobile product or uh, way to access content through their mobile phone, uh, but they don't necessarily assume that they're going to find them. So it's uh, important and it's crucial to for the success of this app to be uh, promoted and to be visible. Uh, on the other hand, the institution needs to guarantee access to see all these uh, resources, such as uh, the access that guarantee to the galleries, galleries and exhibitions. So kind of the um, main uh, aim of this marketing plan was to kind of integrate the mobile offering to the Smithsonian brand, but also um, communicating the idea that accessing contents through uh, mobile marketing effort that has been done all over the institution for uh, the different apps that are out there, either uh, during the launch phase and also currently. So um, to sum summarize um, the finding uh, of this um, report, um, let's say that uh, for almost all the projects there was no budget left for marketing and this affected a lot the visibility of uh, the apps, but also it was for some cases a lack of awareness because many uh, apps were kind of the first app of the, each museum, so they didn't really know how, what to expect and also how to market them, how visitors would have accepted and used them. Uh, also, it was a problem of timing, the, so also timing in contracting with developers, but also, for example, there, oh, here. For example, there was um, mobile apps that were connected to exhibitions, and when the ex exhibition is over, the apps kind of disappear. Um, and I've been mystery shopping uh, all over the mall, it was a lot of fun, uh, to see how the different information are delivered. And it's a, the most stri striking fact is that there is a lot of uh, ununiformity in how they give you information about the apps, and also on the website, on different websites of the different museums, uh, you can find information about the apps in all over the place. When you can find it, you have to really look for them because it was difficult for me that I was reporting, so I was looking for it. But think about some, someone that wants just to um, surf the website and uh, <laughs> cannot really find this information. So there were, of course, some exceptions of uh, re in which results were achieved through uh, no cost or low cost uh, operations, uh, mainly online. So, for example, uh, by 
doing really small things like creating small banners and small uh, graphic signs to put in the front page and visible. So uh, the starting point was to kind of group the apps and to put some order into this uh, huge list, uh, dividing them from uh, based on according to their kind of uh, main features. So there are apps that are mainly um, meant to um, provide a support to the visit, like the, the Zoo app, for example, that is meant to be used throughout the museum. There are also apps that um, are focused on single exhibition or on single um, collections. And there are also apps in, in at this museum, there are four in particular, that use crowdsourcing and collaborative learning to engage with the users and can be used on site and beyond. Um, so from there, I, in the marketing plan, you, you, you can find a series of suggestions that act on different levels. On one hand, there is this need of um, uniformity and kind of um, communicate the Smithsonian mobile offering as a whole and brand it uh, through the creation of an uh, umbrella symbol that can be used to um, be put on different supports, for example, on the mall maps, but also uh, create, for creating buttons for the staff or for volunteers that are instructed and trained to give support to people that might need to, to, to use the app and want to use the app and want to learn more about the different apps of uh, the Smithsonian. So there is also a series of suggestions about the, how to standardize uh, the different information that can be provided, so where to find also Wi-Fi across the mall to download the app if I, if I want to, uh, or uh, where to put the information in the website in a way that are all the same or more or less the same so that I, can, I know I can kind of exp find them where I expect to find them. Um, so these are uh, a series of suggestions, but also mm, let's say that we have to start from the assumption that um, different apps are meant to be used by different people and refer are for different target groups, so we cannot promote them at the same uh, on the same level and in the same spaces. So um, on the you can find them on the um, Smithsonian Mobile Wiki a series of suggestions uh, related to the different kind of apps that are uh, available. So for example, um, an app that is meant to be used throughout the museum. Uh, will need a promotion that is ex extensive throughout the galleries, so you will need to put banners in your website that are really visible and throughout the galleries, not, not, all, not only at the entrance, but also in the actual galleries, so that people that might not have noticed at the entrance that there is an app available, maybe they are visiting mm -hmm. and they, they turn around and they see a sign that tells you, oh, there's an app. So, this, um, so uh, there are also other suggestions for, for example, um, uh, apps that are meant to be used in uh, exhibitions or that are connected to specific collections. Uh, so this is not really rocket science, they're not like fancy uh, strategies, but for some reason all these things weren't done. So uh, for example, if there is an app that is connected to an exhibition, I need to integrate that information and that information that has to be visible in all the supports or the media that I use to uh, to promote the exhibition. And also, for example, the crowdsourcing app could be um, promoted through social media by, for example, sharing the interesting contribution through such the social media pages and so on. So, um, beside this, uh, in the marketing plan, we are, we are working on a tool for internal communication that uh, is kind of the, the topic about collaboration I was talking about at the beginning and that came out in some of the presentation throughout the morning, that by distributing awareness, it's, it's important to distribute awareness throughout the staff because somebody that works in education might notice opportunities for the app, to use the app or use the app that we don't see because we are used to think or to look for certain things. So it's important to create this kind of knowledge all throughout the institution. So we're working on um, uh, on a newsletter, internal newsletter for the Smithsonian staff, check your spam <laughs> folder because uh, we yeah. sent it yesterday and it, went, it well, ended up well, in the yeah, spam yeah. folder. Yeah, Just, did you check your spam? Just mute him. Go ahead, you can okay, and um, so there also we are working on the creation of meeting and workshop that, uh, like this one, create opportunities for, to share and uh, working and leverage. Well, uh, but do, but do. I, so, but I and also working on finding. 
different yeah. platforms <laughs> are always There's delivering the information that are suitable to different audiences that we want to reach ah, no, internally. <laughs> okay. I'm finished. Thank you. I don't know why this isn't muting. So, Marshall Who wants to contribute? Who Uh, ah, yeah, I don't know how to get this anybody knows better than I how to get this to work, please chime in. Hey, Maytar? I'm going to have to eject him. Okay. Hey, Maytar? Hey, Maytar? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know, the mute button's not working. No, I'll tell you. Maytar? Sorry, I don't really want to eject you. I just don't know how to get you to shut up. <laughs> Bye. No. We don't want to block you. He's still there. All right, maybe he'll be quiet. Okay. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Okay, it just took a little while. All right, great. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> You know, the Maoist revolution has happened, and we um, we do all our own tech support. We lay our own fiber optic cable. Um, okay, so what I was just going to talk about um, uh, very briefly, really, because um, we're, we're running a little bit of behind, and I want everybody to have a chance to play with Google Glass, um, which our colleague Patrick Gore has been uh, kindly getting up to speed with and, and coming up with some demos for you. But I just thought I would show you um, some of the resources for this kind of conversation we've been um, uh, undertaking for the past few months uh, at the Smithsonian about, you know, our mobile strategy, which we issued at the end of 2010. Um, there were some kind of minor updates in 2011. Um, but basically, it's, it's kind of something that has been in this... Um, I don't know, I suppose a permanent draft state probably always will be, um, but nonetheless used across the institution. And um, if you want to kind of read up on that, I highly recommend the Smithsonian 2.0 blog as a place where a lot of interesting information is getting posted, not just about mobile, but about web and other projects around the institution. Let me see here, I need to share my screen so people online can see this. We're um, looking at the URL smithsonian20.si.edu. And um, so under the mobile section, uh, we just kind of updated this. There's some links to how you can get involved to our YouTube channel and various things. Um, and you can also get links to um, the current strategic plan, which was really based on this idea of um, recruiting the world, of really looking at the connected potential that the newest generation of mobile devices, and I really take as the watershed moment, um, the kind of the introduction of the smartphone by the iPhone. There were um, uh, PDAs which, you know, were in theory connected devices before that, and I worked with a lot of them, um, but really this kind of ease of use of the, the latest generation of consumer devices has really transformed um, mobile behavior. And Back in the PDA days, it was really only geeks like me and some other hardcore early adapters who really worked with PDAs, but now, as we know, um, they're in the pockets of really a, a majority of museum visitors now, at least in the U.S. and in Europe. Recent surveys at the Air and Space Museum, at the Victorian Outmark Museum um, in London have shown upwards of 70% of visitors are coming with a connected device in their pockets now. So that really, we felt, opened up the door to moving from thinking about mobile as a narrow cast, a one-way delivery of content from the museum to the visitor, um, such as the uh, traditional audio tour, to really creating feedback loops and conversations, not, between, not just between a single visitor in the museum, but among communities. So we saw the potential of the, the new generation of connected devices to really help us recruit the world, um, to help us with the Smithsonian's mission, which is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. So what you hear there are definite echoes of crowdsourcing, of collaborative work, um, of, of really community activity and a very participatory kind of approach to mobile. 
So we've basically been working with that um, for the better part of three years now. And um, nonetheless, you know, technology continues to move on, one of the, the joys and the terrors of it. Um, and so this fall, we decided to kind of look at some of the new possibilities that are open, you know, new, po new uh, things we can do with the new uh, aspects of mobile technology, such as location-based services, which again have been around for a while, but seem to be reaching a new state of usability and pervasiveness and availability to your average mobile user, whoever that is. Um, and we also wanted to look at things like augmented reality um, and personalization services, which again, we're starting to see a lot more of that and just kind of our everyday use of digital tools. And to ask the question really, how does that impact how we can use mobile uh, in museums at the Smithsonian and around the world? So um, this is a blog post you might want to go back and you can see kind of my opening thoughts about is how we can move from recruiting the world to being there. And one of the things that's really struck me about this um, latest kind of generation of location-based and immersive technologies that are uh, possible with mobile devices now is that they, in a funny way, bring us full circle. You know, it used to be at the beginning of, of kind of museum experiences, if you couldn't go there to the museum to be present in front of the collection, you really didn't have an experience. I mean, there might have been, you know, eventually catalogs and photographs, but there was a, a way in which you had to physically be there. The Internet, of course, kind of exploded that and made it possible um, through the digitization of collections to, uh, to put collections online and make them available to anyone, anywhere. Um, so sort of opening hours and things became, I wouldn't at all say irrelevant, but there was a different way that you could, you could be there, as it were. And and now, with the latest generation of mobile, almost ironically, where you are um, has been recognized as so important to your context of use, the kinds of information, the kinds of experiences that you're looking for, that being there has become important again. But of course, the difference from the pre-internet days is you could be in many parts of the world, not just within the museum's four walls, and have a museum experience that is nonetheless tailored to your specific presence in that moment and in that place. So I'm kind of um, fascinated with this new way of being there that is becoming possible due to the new aspects that are now available through mobile technologies, um, such as location-aware, context-aware technologies um, that can create immersive experiences um, through augmented reality and others. Um, and of course, our number one product development principle here at the Smithsonian is accessibility. If it's not accessible, it's probably not a very good product, frankly. And um, we're very keen to work with universal design principles and, and figure out how we can, you know, do things that, you know, like actually putting in that ramp to the front of the museum, putting in that big, bold, clear signage made the museum more usable for everybody, not just people in wheelchairs, not just people with with low vision. So we're asking those kinds of questions of location-based services, of augmented reality, of uh, personalization, of other sort of immersive and, and context-aware technologies as well. How can we use these as an opportunity to improve the experience for everyone? So um, just a kind of quick conclusion, I'm kind of shorthand calling this Smithsonian Mobile 3.0 um, and thinking of it as perhaps going from this theme of recruiting the world to being where people are and this has a lot of echoes in fact of some major concepts that were present not just in our first mobile strategy but also um, in our web uh, strategy, you know, whose development was led by um, Mike Edson, this idea of meeting people where they are and taking them someplace new. Um, so I, I'm very curious to hear what you all think about this. If you'd like to get links to um, this, this blog post and to the other resources uh, that we've put online, notes from our workshops, etc. as we work towards this, um, you just come to the Smithsonian 2.0 blog. I think that's the easiest one-step shop to link out to everything else. Um, you will find yourself um, also for some of these links ending up 
at the Smithsonian's Web Strategy Wiki, um, which has a mobile section. And um, you're very welcome to contribute there as well as on the blog. I will be bringing out some recommendations for the revision of our mobile strategy um, next week, in fact. And so if you want to give me your input, please uh, let me know sooner rather than later. But, you know, any time is also good to hear from you all. So um, I think what I might do, if it's okay, is just spend a couple of minutes on Q&A because we kind of haven't done any of that yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Cody. That's right. You were a last-minute addition yesterday. Lucky you. You get to go almost last. <laughs> okay. So, Cody, did you? Are you speaking a cappella, so to speak, and without notes and everything? Okay. Just, Great. Just a quick relay of some of doing some of this work. Okay. Wonderful. Let me go back to. This is exciting. Let me turn off the screen share so that. There you go. Okay, so everybody can see Cody. Thank you so much. Hi. Please introduce yourself. So I'm Cody. I'm a master's student at uh, University of Toronto, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, digital games and uh, and the museum. It was interesting hearing the presentation earlier, kind of using PowerPoint and those kind of things. The stuff I'm dealing with is uh, programming languages, those kinds of stuff to make it a more interactive, more meaningful experience at the museum. Uh, the most recent thing that I've done was working at the Royal Ontario Museum put on a game jam where they invited the local independent uh, development community to come and make games based on their collection. So we were trying to do stuff with the classical collection, the Egyptians, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, trying to make it more interesting, more accessible. One of the hardest things was making a game accessible from the age four to age 99. That's probably one of the most challenging aspects and one of the things that everybody kind of had to take uh, into what they were doing because when you're doing independent games kind of your own thing, you can target your community. When you're making a game for a museum, it's a whole different animal. The thing that we came up with was we wanted to design, we were all museum students and we wanted to make an interactive game that you could take into a museum and do something fun with it. So we built a card game that you could play in a flash browser or eventually want to build it into iPhones and Androids, but that kind of software is expensive to do that, whereas Flash is cheap and free. Uh, so this card game, you would get it, you would play it, and then you could go through the museum, challenge other people, or you can collect cards from exhibits that you can go and find. You have riddles, questions through the game, and you go through the different exhibits, different places, find these different cards, and it improves your play experience. Um, this is just a really simple idea just to get some, some people going through the museum in a different way. You can do this in more interactive, better types of games where you go through a space and different parts of the game unlock as you're going through the museum so that you're having this interactive experience. It's, it's out of my ability, out of my scope, but if you can get a decent uh, team behind a game like that, you can make a very interactive game that gives a lot of meaning for people who don't necessarily want to read every text panel or maybe the materials are out of touch for them or they're in the age range of 5 to 15 and this just makes everything come alive is kind of the goal with, with these types of games. And a game jam is kind of an incubator for these ideas. So what I found is we had about 20 different teams and everybody was coming at this in a different way. We had these abstract games that are almost like art pieces that you could put with the, the piece that they were representing or you had kind of a little bit more mature games or fighting games. So the, the possibilities are there. Um, and I think, sorry, one second. Um, and one of the best ways to get these games, like we're talking about how do we get these apps onto people's devices? How do we get people to actually go and download these, these games? And Ryerson University in Toronto has just released, is releasing a technology that when you take your device into an area, it pushes the apps onto your phone. So when you come into an area, you'll get the games, you'll get the apps from the thing, and then when you leave, those apps come off. So imagine if you're going down the mall, and you go from museum to museum to museum, and each museum has their own set of apps, and then you go in, you get your apps, you walk up, the next museum has their apps, and it's put right onto your phone for you, and it's taken off of your phone when you leave. So everybody's getting access easy, you don't have to fight with your technology, and if 70% of people are using mobile devices, everybody's going to be able to get a chance to use these things and then we get it out to the users. 
And I think that's all I really wanted to say. I think the future of museum interaction is going to really come down to how well we can get mobile gaming going because you're coming up to a generation of people where everybody games. The average use of games by the time they're an adult is 10,000 hours per person. So you're going to have this medium of communication for everybody to kind of get together and experience these exhibits in new ways. Awesome. Thank you so much. We were hoping we would have some student um, participation and then had reports of shyness. So, Katie, you really <laughs> carried the day. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so let me just do a quick time check with Costis and Irina. How are you guys doing on time? You need to head out. Okay. All right, then I think. I think what I'll do is suggest that we um, maybe do really literally two minutes of, of kind of questions and I'll just repeat the Twitter handle is SI Mobile. Um, if anybody wants to tweet anything in, also please make note of that and our email address, simobile at si.edu. For anything we don't get to today, which is probably going to be a lot of stuff, um, we, I'm very happy to follow up with folks through Twitter or online through email. Um, any burning questions from today? Yeah, Kosti's tweet went. Oh, go ahead, Heather. Question for Cody. Cody, um, how did you get the main band going? Uh, and you know what, Cody? There is a microphone just right behind you, which we're hopeful mm -hmm. might help out a little bit with our friends online. It's not on. Mm -hmm. It's not working. Why don't you come up here? Sorry. <laughs> Um, the Game Jam and the ROM, what happened was this kind of a, a happy meeting between a really vibrant, independent game development community and the ROM who wanted to do something new and creative and they developed this partnership. So doing something like this is really advantageous to be in a city where game development is a big part of the industry. Toronto has one of the most robust mobile game development um, markets in Canada. Canada's number three in the world in game development for profession, which is interesting. So. <laughs> the US, U.S. is number one, um, so there's definitely those kind of opportunities if your museum is situated in, in, a, in a strong community or if you're near a university that has programming and that kind of stuff, um, you can easily negotiate and set it up. I mean, the University of Toronto partnered with the ROM and the ROM partnered with um, the game design community to, to bring this all together. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was, most game jams will have an under attendance kind of problem because people are busy building their own games. A game jam is an opportunity to spend a weekend or a week, just kind of you make a game in a weekend or you make a game in a week or some game jams are a month long. Um, so it gives like this friendly competition, it's a chance to just try new off-the-wall ideas, which is fantastic when you're dealing with a museum and you're trying to pull these different threads together. Like I saw one team going around taking photographs of kind of all the different models of, of the classic world and then they built an RPG with those, with those photos. Like there's a lot of interesting things you can do that I think will only come out in that kind of atmosphere. Again, just because I know it's going to take a little bit of time for everybody to get a chance to try on Google. Has anybody here tried Google Glass already? Okay, small number. All right, so I need to do a huge shout out and thanks to Neil Stimler, our good friend who's at the Met, for inviting me to be one of the three people he was able to invite to get the next gener the next round of distribution of, of Google Glass. And it's thanks to him, really, that the Smithsonian has this Google Glass that we can share around. So um, would you like to do a little quick introduction yeah. from the mic? This is Patrick Gore from our Accessibility Program Office. Hello? So now the cool stuff, right? 
Uh, so thank you. Um, allow me to uh, reiterate a warm welcome to everyone from the University of Toronto students, uh, professors. Uh, also welcome to uh, the Smithsonian staff, other DC professionals. Um, thank you, Nancy and Valeria, for allowing me to speak. Um, so my name is Patrick Orr. I'm a media specialist at the Accessibility Program. So part of my job is learning our newly acquired uh, Google Glass and then sort of figuring out how to uh, leverage the capabilities to our audience. Um, so I'd like to keep this quick. So first I'd just like to sort of talk about how the Google Glass sort of works, not basically on the technology, but how everyone sort of uses it. So the Google Google, I'm sure you've seen Google Plus because they push that um, pretty hard. So anything that you do, well mostly anything you do with the Google Glass, it links to the Google Plus. So the photographs, the videos you take all go to your Google Plus page. Um, you can share them privately with your circles, whoever, your family, friends, whoever you um, feel, um, whoever you want to do that with. Um, at Google's Glass Core, are features like taking photographs, uh, videos. You can search Google, receive, and um, no, receive GPS directions, and send text and video messages. Um, outside the core, they have extensions, which are basically sort of like apps, and Google calls those Glassware. Uh, for instance, that would be uh, YouTube. Um, other cool things like you can use it on a golf course when you're playing golf you can point at the pin see how you know how far it is to the pin um, you can do it on your bike ride how fast you're going uh, how long you've been going distance and also using turn by turn GPS directions uh, now second I'd just like to show you um, before we demo how to actually use the Google Glass so it's very simple obviously you put it on and then this is basically everything you need to know, this part right here. And basically works like on a Mac, you have gestures. So this is the slide back and forth. Tap to deselect. I'm sorry, tap to select. And to deselect, you basically tap and swipe down. That will deselect, exit, and do a lot of different things. And then also the cool thing about Google Glass is it's uh, voice activated. So when it says, OK, Glass, a prompt will come up, and it'll give you sort of prompts on what you can do. All right, you guys ready? Well, um, Nancy, should we just dive right into it? Um, but uh, anything goes as long as you don't break the glass for Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no need to be shy. Um, oh, another thing, this is to adjust the elbow, so you can see in your right eye. So I, mean, I guess I'll go hang out in the back. And then whoever wants to use it, please, don't be shy. Check it out. It's pretty cool. So you present this in the Okay, I'm gonna have to do this this way. Hi, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Who's got the glass? Oh, yeah. Oh, there she is. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Take a picture. Oh, we'll be back. Try Yeah. It's a bit blurry. Can you like get directions back to Toronto? Me hold. Yeah, you can get Google search like, how do I get back to Toronto? Google, how do you get back to Toronto? Yeah. They have turn by turn directions. Using Google Maps. Obviously. 
how much interference is there really have? There's an earpiece in the back. There's also an external mic for external microphone that will speak to you. And then it'll pick up a lot of stuff. You know, I haven't done like testing on how far it's going to be when. I mean, it will pick up all the same noise. So will it like, will it translate what you did? Well, on the Google Hangout, is that what you're sort of talking about? Kind of. So, like, I can connect. I go to the room. Even if I like, if it's like a command, like X blah blah blah, like if I'm gonna pick it up, I can't transfer it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't tested it with all these people, so that's a really good question. So I'm wondering if like some people are saying like, oh, it's not doing anything. There's way too much noise. So I'm wondering what the capability of that's gonna be like if you're in a on the street, right? Yeah, like in New York City or uh, yeah. DC. Yeah, or Toronto. Uh, yeah, like Toronto. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so somebody, uh, somebody else has to use it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, a lot of people do. No, it's kind of like point the same thing. Thank you. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Did the hump train? Yeah. There you go. That's your hump train.